Lisa, thank you very much. I, I am so grateful that Jay, Bruce, Lisa, you are so easily adaptable and accommodating. Thank you, thank you very much. The title of my sermon today is called Changed for Good. And I, this sort of came to mind uh, in, in light of, um, well, what we all have experienced over the last 24 hours. Um, it's hard to put into words. Uh, shock, anger, disbelief. Um, what, what are we to say about where things stand in, in the public discourse here in our country? Um, I am reminded, and I don't mean to be flippant, I'm reminded of the words of Bob Dylan, uh, the times they are a-changing. So as I began to think about this, something dawned on me, and it has to do with change. Do you know this month there is a rather momentous uh, anniversary? We celebrate the 55th anniversary of the Apollo lunar landing. Do you remember watching that? Yeah, I, I remember being with, sitting in, in the living room with mom and dad, watching those ghostly images on TV. It's hard to believe. I'm also curious to know, how many of you had friends, uh, family members, who refused to accept that that actually happened? Yes. My grandfather's older brother, Uncle Robert, refused to acknowledge that that even happened. I, even to his dying day, his response when asked, oh, why, they just made that up in Hollywood. But when you think about it, just, just for a moment, in 1969, Three men were strapped into some sort of device, shot into the space, left this Earth's orbit, orbited around a rock that orbited around this planet. Two gentlemen then landed on the surface of the moon, got out, walked around, climbed back in, and all three of these guys came back home. It represented humanity's culmination of science and engineering. It changed everything. In the 60s, an author and scientist who uh, also part-time does a philosopher by the name of Thomas Kuhn brought into the vernacular paradigm shift. Uh, it was in a, an article he wrote entitled, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. So Kuhn said, new paradigms lead us to seeing the world differently. Now when we receive a new paradigm, the old one has to flee. And this new paradigm has to settle in. That's the challenge. Since this new paradigm changes everything, that's what Uncle Robert could not wrap his brain around. That's what he feared, change. You have said it, I have said it, I can't imagine there is a, an adult on the planet that has not at, at one time or another said, I don't like change. Well, it's true. Almost all living things do not like change. So psychologists tell us that as long as we operate within our comfort zone, all right, this, this little area that allows us to rely on recalling accumulated experiences that help us anticipate outcomes based on those experiences, we can trust in our belief systems. And for the most part, we can function rather well. However, 
when we are confronted with something that changes our assumptive world or something that alters this perception, then we can experience anxiety, anger, fear. We may even be inclined to embrace conspiracy theories. After all, if I am not willing to adapt or unable to adapt, it means something nefarious is at work against me. It's them. It's all of those people. It's, it's that thing out there. I don't know what it is, but that's it. It's not me. So when we struggle with adapting, and let's make something very clear. Uh, Darwin was quite uh, specific. Those species that are able to adapt to change survive. Those that don't, go extinct. So in our attempts to understand what, what is happening around us, to us, we, we actually have a superpower. You and I have no control over most of the random stuff that happens to us. We just don't. We do have one thing we get to control. We get to choose how we respond to the stuff that happens to us. All right, so the scripture passage that I have chosen for today comes from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 24 through 34. And I'm going to be reading from the Common English Bible because it is into this particular environment that Jeremiah interjects himself. The people of Israel could not control or alter the political and military winds that swirled around them, and they were unwilling or incapable of initiating the change that needed to happen to allow them to return to the covenant they had made with Yahweh at Sinai. So the passage reads like this. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will plant seeds in Israel and Judah, and both people and animals will spring up, just as I watched over them to dig up and pull down, to overthrow, to destroy, and bring harm. So I will watch over them to plant and build, declares the Lord. In those days, people will no longer say, sour grapes eaten by parents leave a bitter taste in the mouths of their children. Because everyone will die from their own sins. Whoever eats sour grapes will taste a bitter taste in their mouths. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant with me, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Now, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will no longer need to teach each other to say, know the Lord, because they will know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. So, in the early part of the 6th century before the Common Era, the first wave of the Babylonian Empire marched through Palestine. And it was the direct result of some, you know, particularly catastrophic political miscalculations. And then about 15 to 20 years later, the Babylonians returned, this time to destroy the country, to lay waste to Jerusalem, to raise the temple, and as we know, to carry off into exile most of the people. Now, Jeremiah, well, he would not have been one of the guys you would have invited to a party. He's, um, he's pretty, pretty much doom and gloom. He would bring the whole buzz down, all right? 
However, this section of his oracle is known as the Book of Consolation. And it takes a rather stark turn from his oracles of gloom and doom. These oracles announce God's renewal and restoration for the nation of Israel. This, this is an, an announcement of salvation. Our poet is telling his people there is light no matter how deep the darkness may seem. And the irony here is, of course, that for the people of Israel, they can only see that light in their darkness. So, Jeremiah comes along to hold up a candle to push back against that darkness to remind the people of Israel change is coming. And Jeremiah announces it is a change for good. Now, something needs to be said here. When we are faced with tragedy, when, when things happen that cause us to respond emotionally, we have every right to those feelings. Nowhere does Jeremiah tell the people of Israel to ignore their plight. The lesson is clear. The suffering that comes with grief over loss of any kind, regret over what could have been, anger over perceived or actual injustices, loss of hope, these are all real. And they can be very destructive if they're ignored. If you have ever carried the back-breaking burden of guilt, the heartbreak of loss, despair, somehow find yourself feeling that you had fallen beyond the reach of God's loving arms. Jeremiah says, God will act on your behalf for your well-being. Yes, he says, you get to acknowledge the old is broken, whether by my failure, whether by the failures of others, or whether we decide it's God's failure. It doesn't matter. Jeremiah says, you have a power, and it's a gift from God. You get to choose to hope in the new thing that God is making a reality. Victor Frankl, the psychologist who drew upon his experiences in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II, reasoned that the ability to find meaning was essential to survival in the desperately dehumanizing environment of the camps. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he writes that you and I have an existential motivation to make meaning of our experiences. And it is necessary in any circumstance when we face unavoidable suffering. Frankl asserted that the ability to choose one's attitude toward suffering is the last of all human freedoms. Our, let's just call it attitudinal heroism and our existential courage woven together with God's love and compassion allows us to transform our personal tragedies into triumphs. When it's no longer possible to change our situation with God holding firmly to our hand, we can rise to the challenge of changing ourselves. If you change your heart, Jeremiah says, God can help you change how you interpret your circumstances. In light of that, I can reason that my life can experience a fertile time of building anew and planting anew. 
All I have to do is make the choice. And it is in the choosing that makes all the difference. And then Jeremiah adds one more thing. He said, oh, by the way, God is not finished. Yahweh offers to do something as well. God offers a new and and here, Jeremiah makes it very clear. This is a radical proposal offered by God. God chooses to change God's own heart. Now, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, says the Lord. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will remember their sins no more. The requirements of this new covenant now mean that God's truths for all of God's children will be installed within our hearts. Now they will be intertwined with our emotions and our hopes and our most sacred dreams. In a world in which books are balanced, scores are kept, and where it seems that often nothing is forgiven, God chooses to never hold anything against us. This is no longer a covenant of do's and don'ts. It's a covenant of internalized integrity. God is offering us a partnership. The tone is one of communion and relationship, of sacred achievement and shared responsibility. God desires for you and me wholeness and well-being, so much so that God is willing to change God's own heart for us. So what exactly does that mean? I think it means that this change in relationship can allow you and me in a world of cold technology to practice sacrament. In a world of cruelty to perform, to perform acts of generosity. In a world of selfish indulgence to live obediently. To acknowledge grief in a world of denial to live out hope in a world of despair and to be instruments of peace in the face of rage and anger and pain. And if we are able to hold back our fears, then we become agents of change for those around us. This new partnership that God chooses to establish with us for the ancient Hebrew people was a total paradigm shift. It altered the old pattern of failure and transformed it into a relationship of acceptance, of love, forgiveness, and the victory of new possibilities. I will remember their sins no more. In this new covenant, God already knows what you and I need to be made whole. It's freedom. Freedom that comes by the way of forgiveness, which opens up the way to live in relationship with God. It is God's intent to break the cycle of our guilt and punishment, which seems to be where we often always find ourselves. Because in forgiving and forgetting, God opens up all the optimistic opportunities of righteousness. Now we have a relationship that's about conversation over demands. It's about covenant over condemnation. And in the divine beauty of God's action towards us, 
God chose amnesia and mercy in order to forgive so that God could be in relationship with us. So where does that put us? We get to choose. We get to take this gift and we get to use it for ourselves, but not ourselves alone, for others. You see, so much of who we are obviously is because of who God is. But so much of who God is is because of who we are. It's because of God's love that God chose to imprint upon our hearts what that love and what that vision can look like. We are imprinted on God. God is imprinted on us. We've both been changed for good. 